I'm Alice Slater. I'm living here in the belly of the beast in New York City in Manhattan. I've been an anti-nuclear activist since 1987, but I got my start as an activist in 1968 as a housewife living in Massapequa with my two babies. And I was watching television and I saw an old news film of Ho Chi Minh going to Woodrow Wilson in 1919 after World War I, begging us to help him get the French out of Vietnam. And we turned him down, and the Soviets were more than happy to help. And that's how he became a communist. They showed that he even modeled his constitution on ours, you know, and this is when the news showed you real news. And the same night, the kids at Columbia University were rioting in Manhattan. They had locked the president in his office. They didn't want to go into this terrible Vietnam War. And I was terrified. I thought it was like the end of the world in America, in New York, in my city. These kids are acting up. I better do something, you know. So, and I had just turned 30, and they were saying, don't trust anyone over 30. That was their model. And I went out to the Democratic Club that week, and I joined. They were having a debate between the Hawks and the Doves, and I joined the Doves, and I became active in Eugene McCarthy's campaign to challenge the war in the Democratic Party, and I never stopped. That was it. And we went through when McCarthy lost that we took over the whole Democratic Party. It took us four years. We nominated George McGovern, and then the media killed us. They didn't write one honest word about McGovern. They didn't talk about the war or the poverty or civil rights or women's rights. It was all about McGovern's vice president's candidate had been hospitalized 20 years earlier for manic depression. It was like O.J. Moniker. It was just like this junk and he lost very badly. And it's interesting because just this month, the Democrats said they're going to get rid of the superdelegates. Well, they put the superdelegates in after McGovern got the nomination because they were so shocked that ordinary people going door to door, and we didn't have an internet, we rang doorbells and spoke to people, were able to capture the whole Democratic Party and nominate an anti-war candidate. So that gave me a sense that even though I didn't win these battles, that democracy can work. I mean, the, the possibility is there for us. And so how did I become an anti-nuclear activist? I, I, in Massapequa, I was a housewife. Women didn't go to work then. You know, in my junior high school autograph book, when they said, your life's ambition, I wrote down housework. <laughs> this, was, <laughs> this was what we believed in those years. And that's, I think I'm still doing global housework, you know, but I just want to tell the boys to put away their toys and clean up the mess they made. So I went to law school and I, it, that was quite a challenge. And I was working, you know, full-time litigation, civil litigation. I was out of all my good works that I had done all those years. And I see in the law journal, there's a luncheon for the Lawyers' Alliance for Nuclear Arms Control. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So I go to the luncheon, and I wind up vice chair of the New York chapter. I go on the board with McNamara and Colby, I mean, like, and uh, Stanley Rizzo. He was Nixon's Secretary of Defense. And when we finally got the Comprehensive Test Ban tr Treaty passed, he came up, he said, now are you happy, Alice? Because <laughs> I was such a nag. <laughs> So anyway, there I was with the, the, um, the Lawyers' Alliance, and the Soviet Union under Gorbachev had stopped nuclear testing. They had a march in Kazakhstan that was led by this so, uh, Kazakh poet, Olza Suleimanov, because the people in the Soviet Union were so upset in Kazakhstan. They had so much cancer and birth defects and waste in their community. And they marched and stopped nuclear testing. Gorbachev said, OK, we're not going to do this anymore. And it was underground at that point because Kennedy wanted to end nuclear testing, and they wouldn't let him. So they only ended testing in the atmosphere, but it went underground. And we did a 1,000 tests after it went underground on the Western Shoshone Holy Land in Nevada, you know, and it was leaking and poisoning the water. I mean, it was not a good thing to do. 
So we went to Congress and said, uh, listen, Russia, our lawyers alliance, you know, we had connections there. Russia stopped, you know, Soviet Union actually. We should stop. And they said, oh, you can't trust the Russians. So Bill DeWind, who was the founder of the Lawyers Alliance for Nuclear Arms Control, was president of the New York City Bar Association and was part of the Dutch DeWinds that had half the Hudson, you know, early settlers, real old line American, raised eight million dollars from his friends, put together a team of seismologists. And we went over to the Soviet Union, a delegation, and we met with the Soviet Lawyers Association and the Soviet government, and they agreed to allow our American seismologists to be placed all around the Kazakh test site so that we could verify if they were cheating. And we came back to Congress and said, okay, you don't have to trust the Russians. We have seismology uh, going there. and." Congress agreed to stop nuclear testing. This was like an amazing victory, but like every victory, it came with a cost that they would stop and wait 15 months and provided that uh, the safety and reliability of the arsenal and the cost and benefits, they could have an option to do another 15 nuclear tests after this moratorium. And we said we have to stop the 15 nuclear tests, you know, because it would be bad faith with the Soviet Union that was letting our seismologists in. And I was at a meeting, the, the group now is called the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability, but it was then the Military Production Network. And it was all the sites in the U.S., like Oak Ridge, Livermore, Los Alamos, that were making the bomb. And I had left the law to, after the Soviet visit, you know, an economist asked me if I would help them set up economists against the arms race. So I became executive director. I had 15 Nobel laureates and Galbraith, and we joined this network to do a conversion project, like economic conversion in the nuclear weapons facility, and I got lots of funding from, you know, MacArthur and Blasier. They loved this. And uh, I go to the first meeting, and we're having a meeting, and we're saying, uh, now we have to stop the 15 safety tests. And Daryl Kimball, who was then the head of Physicians for Social Responsibility, said, oh, no, Alice, that's the deal. They're going to do the 15 safety tests. And I said, I did not agree to that deal. And Steve Schwartz, who was the, later became editor of the Bulletin Atomic Scientist, but at that time was with Greenpeace, said, why don't we take out a full-page ad in the New York Times saying, don't blow it, Bill, with Bill Clinton, with a, his saxophone. They were all showing him, you know, with a, 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 a nuclear explosion coming out of his sack. So I go back to New York, and I'm with The Economist, and I have free office space. I used to call these guys communist millionaires, like they were very left-wing, but they had a lot of money and they were giving me free office space. And I go into the head, Jack's artistic, I said, Jack, we got the moratorium, but Clinton's going to do another 15 safety tests and we have to stop it. And he says, what should we do? I said, we need a full page ad in the New York Times. He said, how much is it? I said, $75,000. He said, who's going to pay for it? I said, you and Murray and Bob. He says, OK, call them up. If they say, I'll, I'll put in 25. And I, like in 10 minutes, I raise it. And we have the poster. You can see, don't blow it, Bill. And it went on t-shirts and mugs and, uh, you know, uh, mouse pads. It was on every kind of merchandising. And they never did the 15 extra tests. We stopped it. It was, it ended. And then, of course, when Clinton signed the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was a huge campaign, they had this kicker in there where he was giving six billion dollars to the labs for subcritical tests and uh, laboratory tests, and they never really stopped, you know, he said subcritical tests are not a test, like, because they blow up plutonium with chemicals, and they did like 30 of them already at the Nevada Tesla, but because it doesn't have a chain reaction, he said it's not a test, you know, like I didn't inhale, I didn't have sex, and I'm not testing. So, you know, as a result of that, India tested, because they said, you know, we can't, 
have a comprehensive test ban treaty unless we preclude the subcriticals and the laboratory tests because they quietly had their bomb in the basement but they weren't up to us and they didn't want to be left behind and we did it anyway over their objection even though you needed unanimous consent to the committee on disarmament in geneva they took it out of the committee and brought it to the un the ctp opened it up for signature and India said, if you don't change it, we're not signing it. And six months later or so, they tested, followed by Pakistan. So it was another arrogant, Western, white, colonial. As a matter of fact, I mean, I'll tell you a, a personal story. I, we had a party at the NGO Committee on Disarmament, like cocktails, to welcome Richard Butler, the Australian ambassador that pulled it out of the committee over India's objection and brought it to the UN and I'm standing and talking with him and everybody's having a few drinks. I said, what are you going to do about India? He says, I just came back from Washington. I was with Sandy Berger, Clinton's security guard. We're going to screw India. We're going to screw India. He said it twice like that. And I start arguing. I said, what do you mean? I mean, India is not. And he kisses me on one cheek, and he kisses me on the other cheek. You know, tall, good-looking guy. And I back away, and I think if I was a guy, he would never have stopped me that way, that he stopped me from arguing with him. But that was, that was the mentality. It's still the mentality. It's that arrogant, Western, colonial attitude that's keeping everything in place. This was wonderful. We all came to the... Uh, to the NPT in 1995. The Non-Proliferation Treaty was negotiated in 1970. And five countries, the US, Russia, China, England, and France, promised to give up their nuclear weapons if all the rest of the world wouldn't get them. And everybody signed this treaty except India, Pakistan, and Israel, and they went and got their own bombs. But the treaty had this Faustian bargain that if you sign the treaty, we'll give you the keys to the bomb factory because we gave them so-called peaceful nuclear power. And that's what happened with North Korea. They got their peaceful nuclear power. They walked out. They made a bomb. We were concerned that Iran might be doing that because they were enriching their uranium. Anyway, so the treaty's due to expire, and we all come to the UN. This is my first time at the UN. I don't know anything about the UN. I'm meeting people from all over the world, and many of the founders of Abolition 2000. And there's one very experienced person there from the Union of Concerned Scientists, Jonathan Dean, who was a former ambassador. And we all had a meeting, the NGOs. I mean, they call us. NGOs, non-governmental organizations, that's our title, we're not an organization, we're non, you know. So, so here we are with Jonathan Dean and he says, you know, we NGOs, we should draft a statement. And we said, oh, yeah, he says, I have a draft, you know, and he hands it out. And it's U.S. Uber Alice, it's arms control forever, it didn't ask the abolition. And we said, no, we can't sign this. And we got together and drafted our own statement about 10 of us, Jackie Cabasso, David Krieg, and myself, Alan Weir, you know, we were all, all the old timers. And we didn't even have the internet then. We faxed it out, and by the end of the four-week meeting, 600 organizations had signed on. And in the statement, we asked for a treaty to eliminate nuclear weapons by the year 2000. We acknowledged the inextricable link between nuclear weapons and nuclear power and asked for the uh, phasing out of nuclear power and the establishment of an international renewable energy agency. And, you know, then we organized. I was running a nonprofit. I'd left The Economist. I had Grace Global Resource Action Center for the Environment. So David Krieger was the first secretariat at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and then it moved to me. Mm -hmm. To Grace. We each kept it like around five years. I don't think David had it five years, but there was like a five year term, then we moved it. You know, we tried, we didn't want to make it. Yeah. And uh, when I was at Grace, we. Uh, we did get the Sustainable Energy Agency through. We were part of the, uh, we joined with the Economic, and the uh, Commission on Sustainable Development and lobbied and produced this beautiful report with 188 footnotes in 2006 that said sustainable energy is possible now and it's still true. And I'm, I've even been circulating that report again because it's not really that out of date. And, uh, you know, and. 
I think we have to speak about the uh, environment and climate and sustainable energy together with nuclear weapons because we're in this crisis point. We can destroy our whole planet either by nuclear weapons or by catastrophic climate uh, disasters. So I'm very uh, involved now in different groups that are trying to bring the message together. Well, the most positive was we drafted a model nuclear weapons convention with lawyers and scientists and activists, you know, and policy makers, and it became an official UN document and it had, you know, like a treaty, here's what you guys have to sign. Of course, it could be negotiated, but at least we put out the model for people to see. It went all over the world and the accomplishment of sustainable Mm -hmm. energy. Otherwise, I mean, that, that was where our two goals. Now, what happened, like in 1998, everybody said, well, abolition 2000, we said we should have the treaty by the year 2000, in 95. What are you going to do about your name? So I said, let's, let's get 2000 organizations and we'll say we're 2000. So then we kept the name. So, you know, I think uh, it was great. It, it networked. It was in many countries. We had to, it was very non-hierarchical. Secretary, it went from me to uh, Steve Staples in Canada, and then it went to Pax Christie in Pennsylvania with David Robinson. He's not around. And then Susie took it, and now it's with IPB, you know. But in the meantime, this whole, the, the focus of Abolition 2000 was so MPT oriented, and now this new ICANN campaign grew up because they never honored their promises. You know, even Obama, Clinton undercut the, the comprehensive test ban treaty. It wasn't comprehensive, it didn't ban tests. Obama promised for his little deal that he made with Red Vegger where they got rid of 1,500 weapons, a trillion dollars over the next 10 years for two new bomb factories in Kansas and Oak Ridge and new, you know, planes, submarines, missiles, bombs. So it's still, it's got tremendous momentum, the nuclear uh, warmongers there, you know, and it's crazy. You can't use them. We only use them twice, you know. Well, it's, there's a loophole because it doesn't promise, like the chemical and biological weapons say they're prohibited, they're illegal, they're unlawful, you can't have them, you can't share them, you can't use them. The MPT just said, we five countries make good faith, will make good faith efforts, that's the language, to eliminate, you know, for nuclear disarmament. Well, I was on another lawyers group, the Lawyers Committee for Nuclear Policy, that challenged the nuclear weapon states, we brought a case to the World Court and the World Court let us down because they left the loophole there. They said they are gen nuclear weapons are generally illegal. That's like being generally pregnant, right? you know. And then they said, uh, we can't say whether they're illegal in the case where the very survival of a state is at stake. So they allowed deterrence. And that's when the ban treaty idea came. Listen, they're not legal. We have to have a document that says they're prohibited, like just like chemical and biological. We got a lot of help from the International Red Cross that changed the conversation because it was getting very wonky. It was deterrence and you know military strategy and blah blah. They brought it back to the human level of the catastrophic consequences of the use of any nuclear weapon and that so they they reminded people what these weapons are about we sort of forgot you know the Cold War is over that's another thing I thought the Cold War is over my goodness you know what's the problem I couldn't believe how entrenched they were that stockpile stewardship program of Clinton came after the war fell you know so that was you know, and then there were a group of old timers that felt very bad because they had brought the world court guy. I was on that board of the lawyers committee. I resigned because I came to make a legal argument. They weren't supporting the ban treaty because they were so invested in what they had done in the world court that they were trying to argue, well, they're already illegal and we don't need a treaty to say they're banned. And I thought that was not a good strategy for, you know, for changing the conversation. And I was dismissed, you don't know what you're talking about, I never heard anything so stupid, so then I quit 
the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy because that was ridiculous, you know. And uh, right, it's like it's like the Security Council is damaged. It's the same five states on the UN Security. You know, these are the victors in World War II, and things are changing. We have to, what changed, which I love is that the ban treaty was negotiated through the General Assembly. We bypassed the Security Council, we bypassed the five vetoes, and we had a vote, and 122 nations voted. Now, a lot of the nuclear weapon states boycotted the, they did, they boycotted it, and, uh, and their, the nuclear umbrella, which is quite a, you know, the NATO alliance and the three countries in Asia, Australia, South Korea and um, Japan are under the U.S. nuclear deterrent. So they supported us. What was really unusual and that never got reported, which I think is, was, a, was a harbinger, when they first voted at the General Assembly whether there should be negotiations, North Korea voted yes. Nobody even reported that. I thought that was significant, like they were sending a signal that they wanted to ban the bomb. You know? Then later they pulled, I mean, Trump got elected, things went crazy, and uh, yes, that, I think that really gave the, the, the ban treaty had started, the, you know, we had this meeting in Oslo, and then another meeting in Mexico, and then South Africa gave that speech at the MPT where they said, this is like nuclear apartheid, we can't keep coming back to this meeting where nobody's keeping their promises for nuclear disarmament, and you're, the nuclear weapon states are holding the rest of the world hostage mm -hmm. to their nuclear bombs, and that was tremendous momentum going into the Austria meeting where we also got a statement from Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really shifted the conversation, and he also voted, the Vatican voted for it during the negotiations and put in great statements, and the Pope, up till then, had always supported the U.S. deterrence policy, you know, and they said deterrence was okay, it was all right to have nuclear weapons if you were using them in self-defense, you know, when your very survival is at stake. That was the exception that the World Court made. Mm -hmm. So that's over now. So there's like a whole new conversation happening now, and uh, we already have I don't know, 19 countries have ratified it and 70 or so have signed and we need 50 to ratify before it enters into force. The other thing that's interesting when you say we say we're waiting for India and Pakistan, we don't wait for India and Pakistan. Like with India, we took the CTB out of the Committee on Disarmament even though they vetoed it. Now we're trying to do the same thing for Pakistan. They want this treaty to cut off fissile materials for weapons purposes. And Pakistan's saying, if you're not going to do it for everything, we're not going to be left out of the, you know, the plutonium race. And now they're thinking of, you know, overriding Pakistan. But China and Russia have proposed in 2008 and in 2015 a treaty to ban weapons in space and the U.S. vetoes it in the Committee on Disarmament. There's no discussion. We won't even allow it to be discussed. Nobody's bringing the treaty to the U.N. over our objection. You know, we're the only country that's vetoing it. And I think, looking forward now, how are we going to really get to nuclear disarmament? If we can't heal the U.S.-Russian relationship and tell the truth about it, we're doomed because there's like almost 15,000 nuclear weapons on the planet and 14,000 are in the U.S. and Russia. I mean, all the other countries have a thousand between them. That's China, England, France, Israel, India, Pakistan, North Korea. But we're the big gorillas on the block. And I've been studying this relationship. I'm amazed. First of all, in 1917, Woodrow Wilson sent 30,000 troops to St. Petersburg to help the white Russians against the peasant uprising. I mean, what were we doing there in 1917? This is like capitalism was a friend. You know, there was no Stalin. They was just peasants trying to get rid of the czar, you know. Anyway. 
that was the first thing I saw that was like amazing to me that we were so hostile to Russia. And then after World War II, when we and the Soviet Union defeated Nazi Germany and we set up the United Nations to end the scourge of war, and it was very idealistic, Stalin said to Truman, turn the bomb over to the UN because we had just used, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that was like terribly frightening technology. Truman said no. So Stalin got his own bomb. He wasn't going to be left behind. And then when the wall came down, Gorbachev and Reagan met and said, let's get rid of all our nuclear weapons. And Reagan said, yeah, good idea. Gorbachev said, but don't do Star Wars. We have a, a, a document that I hope you'll show at some point. Vision 2020, which is the U.S. Space Command, has its mission statement, dominating and controlling uh, the U.S. use the U.S. interests in space to protect U.S. interests and investments. I mean, they're shameless. That's what their mission statement says from the U.S. Space Command. So. Gorbachev said, yeah, but don't do Star Wars. And Reagan said, I can't give that up. So Gorbachev said, well, forget about nuclear disarmament. And then they were very concerned about East Germany when the war came down, being united with West Germany and being part of NATO because Russia lost 29 million people during World War II to the Nazi onslaught. I can't believe that. I mean, I'm Jewish. We talk about our six million people, how terrible. Who hurt 29 million people? I mean, look what happened. We lost 3,000 in New York with the World Trade. You know, we started World War VII. So, anyway, uh, so Reagan said, I just want to finish. Reagan said to uh, Gorbachev, uh, don't worry, we'll you know, let East Germany be united, West Germany enter into NATO, and we promise you we will not expand NATO one inch to the east. And Jack Matlock, who is Reagan's ambassador to Russia, wrote an op-ed in the Times repeating this. I mean, I'm not just making this up. And we now have NATO right up to Russia's border. Then, uh, after we boasted about our Stuxnet virus, Putin sent a letter, oh, no, even before that, Clinton, I want to go back to Clinton, Putin asked Clinton, let's get together and cut our arsenals to a thousand and call everybody at the table to negotiate for nuclear disarmament, but don't put missiles into Eastern Europe because they were already starting to negotiate with Romania for a missile thing. Clinton said, I can't promise that. So that was the end of that offer. And then Putin asked Obama to negotiate a cyberspace treaty after these, you know, let's not have cyber war. And we said no. And if you look at what America's doing now, they're, they're gearing up against cyber war, they're gearing up against Russia's nuclear arsenal. And if I can, I mean, I, if I can, I'd just like to read what Putin said. He gave his State of the Union speech in March, and he said, uh, in Mo this March, Putin, you know, we're demonizing him, we're blaming them for the election, which is ridiculous, I mean, it's the Electoral College. You know, Gore won the election, we blame Ralph Nader, who was an American saint, he gave us clean air, clean water, SEPA. Then Hillary won the election, and we're blaming Russia instead of fixing our Electoral College, which is a holdover from the white landed gentry that was trying to control popular power. You know, just like we got rid of slavery and women got the vote, we should get rid of the Electoral College. Anyway, in March, Putin said, back in 2000, the U.S. announced its withdrawal from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. That's Bush walked out of it. Russia was categorically against this. We saw the Soviet-U.S. ABM Treaty signed in 1972 as the cornerstone of the international system. Together with the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the ABM Treaty not only created an atmosphere of trust, but also prevented either party from recklessly using nuclear weapons, which would have endangered humankind. We did our best to dissuade the Americans from withdrawing from the treaty, 
all in vain. The U.S. pulled out of the treaty in 2002. Even after that, we tried to develop constructive dialogue with the Americans. We proposed working together in this area to ease concerns and maintain the atmosphere of trust. At one point, I thought a compromise was possible, but this was not to be. All our proposals, absolutely all of them were rejected. And then we said that we would have to improve our modern strike system to protect our security. And they did. And we're using that as an excuse to build up our military, which we had the perfect opportunity to stop the arms race. They each time offered that to us, and each time we rejected it. Well, now we can say they're illegal, they're outlawed. It's not some kind of, you know, wishy-washy language. So we can speak more forcefully. And, you know, the U.S. never signed the landmines treaty, but we don't make them anymore and we don't use them. So we're going to stigmatize the bomb. And there are some wonderful campaigns, uniquely the divestment campaign, we're learning from the fossil fuel friends that we're saying you shouldn't invest in nuclear weapons and, and attacking the corporate structure. And we have a great project that came out of ICANN, Don't Bank on the Bomb, that's being run out of uh, the Netherlands with Pax Christie. Um, and here in New York, we had such a wonderful experience. I mean, we went to our city council to divest. We spoke to the the finance chair of the council, and he said he would write a letter to the controller, controls all the investments for the pensions of the city, which billions of dollars, you know, if we could get 10 members of the council to sign on with him. So we had like a small committee from ICANN. It wasn't a big job. And we just started making phone calls, and we got a majority, like 28 members of the city council, to sign this letter. I mean, I called my councilman. And they told me he was on paternity leave. He had had his first child. So I wrote him a long letter saying, what a wonderful gift to your child to have a nuclear free world if you would sign this letter. And he signed one. I mean, it was like, it was, it was easy. It was really great that we did that. So, uh, so that's how I think we're going to, and also in the NATO states. I mean, they're not going to stand for this. They're not going to stand for it because the people don't even know. We have U.S. nuclear weapons in five NATO states, uh, Italy, uh, Belgium, Holland, Germany, and Turkey. And people don't even know this, but now we're getting uh, demonstrations, people are getting arrested, the plowshares operations, all these nuns and priests and Jesuit, you know, like the, the anti-war movement and there's demonstrate there was a big demonstration at the German base right after the and it got publicity and I think that's going to be another way to arouse people's interest because it went away they weren't thinking about it you know the war was over and nobody really knew that we're living with these things point at each other and you know it's not even that it would be deliberately used because I doubt if anybody would do that but the possibility for accident is like we just we just we could luck out. We've been living under a lucky star. There's so many stories of near misses and this Colonel Petrov from Russia, who was such a hero. He was in the missile silo and he saw something that indicated that they were being attacked by us, and he was supposed to unleash all his bombs against New York and Boston, and, and he waited, and it was a computer glitch. And he even got reprimanded for not following orders, you know, so. Died in poverty. And in, in America, uh, we had, just about three years ago, there was a Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota had a plane loaded with missiles, six missiles loaded with nuclear weapons that went to Louisiana by accident. It was missing for 36 hours and they didn't even know where it was. You know, I mean, this, it's like uh, we're just lucky. We're living in a fantasy. This is like boy stuff. It's terrible. We should stop. Yes, well, I think we have to broaden the conversation. That's why I'm working in World Beyond War because it's a wonderful new network that's trying to make the end of war on the planet an idea whose time has come. And they also, they do a divestment campaign, not just nuclear, but everything. And they're working with Code Pink, which is a wonderful, they have a new divest campaign that you can join. Um, the video of Medea Benjamin just went viral, didn't it? it was oh, that was incredible. She's fabulous. <laughs> I know Medea for years. I met her uh, 
at I met her down in uh, Rio, not Rio, but in Brazil. We had a big uh, world, Port better Port world Port as possible. Port, yeah. Port Port yeah, I met her there. And I went to Cuba because she was then running these uh, trips to Cuba. She, she's a fabulous activist. So anyway, uh, World Beyond War is www.worldbeyondwar.org. Join, sign up. There's a lot of things you can do for it or with it. You know, you can write for it or talk about it or enroll more people. I was in an organization called The Hunger Project in 1976. And that was also to make the end of hunger on the planet, an idea his time has come. And we just kept enrolling people. And we put out facts, like we talked, this is what War Beyond War does, the myths about war, like it's inevitable, there's no way to end it, and then the solutions. And we did that with hunger. And like, you know, we said starvation is not inevitable, there is, there is enough food, you know, population is not a problem because people automatically limit the size of their families when they know they're being fed. So we had all these facts that we just kept putting out all over the world, and now, we haven't ended hunger, but it's part of the Millennium Development Goals. It's a respectable idea. When we said it, it was like ridiculous. And saying we could end war, people said, don't be ridiculous, there'll always be war. Well, the whole purpose is to show all the solutions and the possibilities and the myths about war and how we can end it. And looking at the U.S.-Russia relationship is part of it. We have to start telling the truth, right? So there's that and there's I can, because you know, they are working to get the story out about the ban treaty in different ways, so I would definitely check that out, www.icanw.org, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And, um, and I try to get into some kind of local energy, uh -huh. sustainable energy. I'm doing a lot of that now because it's ridiculous that we're letting these corporations poison us with nuclear and fossil and biomass. You know, they're burning food to make when we have all the abundant energy of the sun and the wind and geothermal and hydro and efficiency, efficiency itself could end. Uh, so that's what I would recommend as a, for an activist. Well, first of all, I'd tell them to make sure they're registered to vote, right? You know, they don't have to take care of nuclear weapons, just take care of being a citizen, register to vote and vote for the people that want to cut military budgets and, you know, want to clean up the environment. We had like such a fabulous selection in New York, this Alexandria Cortez. She lived in my old neighborhood in the Bronx where I grew up. She, that's where she lives now. And I mean, she's just had this like extraordinary turnout against a real established politician. And it's because people voted, people cared. So I, I, I think we should, as speaking as an American, we should have required civics for every senior in high school. And we should have only paper ballots and as seniors, they come to the election and count the paper ballots so, and then register to vote so they can learn arithmetic and they can register to vote and we never have to worry about a computer stealing our vote. This is like such nonsense when you can just count the ballots, you know. It's like, I, th I think citizenship is really important and we have to look at what kind of citizenship. I heard this fabulous lecture by a Muslim woman in Canada a world beyond war, we just did a Canadian conference. We have to like rethink our relationship to the planet, you know, and she was talking about colonialism that went all the way back into Europe when they had the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I never thought of it going back that far. I thought we started it in America, but they were starting it when they threw the Muslims and the Jews out of Spain, you know, and they were doing it then. And we have to like re think this. We have to get in touch with the land, with the people, and start telling the truth about things. Because we're not, if we're, if we're not honest about it, we can't fix it. Well, I think I said at the beginning, when I first became an activist, I won. I mean, I captured the whole Democratic Party. It's true that the media defeated us. 
you know, we went to Congress and we won. We got them to do a moratorium, but we're always losing while we're winning, you know? I mean, it was like one, 10 steps forward, one step back. So that's what keeps me going. It's not like I haven't had successes, but I haven't had the real success of a world without war. It's not just nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons is like the tip of the spear, and the, you know we have to get rid of all the weapons. It was so encouraging when these kids marched against the National Rifle. We had a hundred thousand people marching in New York, and they were all young, very few my age. And they were registering people to vote online. And this last primary that we had in New York, there were twice as many people voting in the primary as the year before. Mm. So I think it's, it's sort of like the 60s now, right. you know? Like people are getting active, they know they have to... So I don't think, it's not just getting rid of nuclear weapons because if we get rid of war, we'll get rid of nuclear weapons, you know, and maybe, maybe nuclear weapons is very specialized, like you really have to know where the bodies are buried and, you know, follow the ICANN campaign, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that war is ridiculous. I mean, it's so 20th century. We haven't won a war since World War II, so what are we doing here? The money, you have to... We have to rein it in, you know. We used to have a fairness doctrine where you couldn't uh, dominate the airwaves just because you had money. We have to take back a lot of these utilities. Like, I think we have to make our electric company in New York public. Mm -hmm. Boulder, Colorado did that because they were shoving nuclear and fossil fuel down their throats and they wanted wind and sun, and I think we have to organized economically, you know, socially, and that's what you're seeing from Bernie and Octavia. It's, it's growing, and if we could, you know, when you say nobody cares about nuclear weapons, we did public opinion polls. 87% of Americans said, let's get rid of them if everybody else agrees to. So we have public opinion on our side. We just have to mobilize it through these horrible blocks that have been established by what Eisenhower were, warned the military industrial, but I call it military industrial congressional media complex, you know, I mean there's like a lot of concentration. The, the uh, Occupy Wall Street, I mean, they brought out this meme, the 1% versus the 99%. People were not aware of how maldistributed everything was. You know, FDR saved America from communism when he made social security, you know, he shared some of the wealth. Then it got very greedy again with Reagan through Clinton and Obama, and that's why Trump got elected, because so many people were hurting. I, there's one thing I didn't tell you that might be interesting. In the 50s, we were so terrified of communism. I mean, I went to Queens College. That was McCarthy year in America. I went to Queens College in 1953, and I'm having a discussion with somebody, and she says, here, you should read this, and she gives me this pamphlet, and it says, Communist Party of America, and my heart is pounding, I'm terrified. I put it in my book bag, I take the bus home, I go directly to the eighth floor, walk to the incinerator, throw it down without even looking. That's how scared. Then, in 1989 or whatever, after Gorbachev came in and I was with the Lawyers Alliance, I went to Soviet Union for the first time. And first of all, every guy over 60 was wearing his World War II medals. And every street corner had a stone monument to the dead, the 29 million. And then you go to the Leningrad Cemetery and there's mass graves, you know, big mounds, people, 400,000 people. So I look at this, and my guide, we had guide said to me, why don't you Americans trust us? I said, why don't we trust you? What about Hungary? What about Czechoslovakia? You know, arrogant America. He looks at me with tears in his eyes. He says, but we had to protect our country from Germany. And I looked at the guy, and that was his, that was their truth. Not what they did was good, but I mean, they were acting out of their fear of invasion and what they had suffered, and we, were, we weren't getting the right story. So I think if we're going to make peace now, we've got to start telling the truth 
about our relationship and who's doing who to what and what where we have to be more open and I think it's happening, you know, with the Me Too's, with the Confederate statues, with Christopher Columbus. I mean, nobody ever thought about the truth of that, and we are now. So I think if we, you know, start looking at what's really happening, we can act appropriately.